Welcome to church. We're so glad that you're with us today. If you'd like to know more information about Abundant Life, please visit AbundantLifeChapel.ca and you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram for more information. Uh, special thanks to everybody who has been supporting us financially. We appreciate every gift and giver. And if you'd like to continue to do so, please download the app Tithely and you can also give through our webpage at AbundantLifeChapel.ca. I hope this message will inspire you and build your faith. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came How great is your love You bore my weakness You took my shame Buried my burdens In fields of grace You drew me out Lifted me up How great is your love down to earth in a same perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed yes we stand in awe here we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great
great is your love how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love for us What comes to your mind when you think of integrity? Do you immediately think of someone's character, or do you think of the structural integrity like that of a building or a bridge? Do you think of business practices, maybe politics or, or relationships? Do you think of individuals that are good examples of integrity, or do you think of those who maybe lack integrity? What comes to your mind when you think of integrity? We're on week two of our series called Integrity. This series was inspired by Bill Pipke's book, Integrity, The Best Foundation. In this series, we're going to examine six pillars of integrity that Bill has identified in his book, as well as look to Scripture, God's Word, to examine the lives of real people who lived out these pillars of integrity. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, 
But whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Today, we'll be looking at the pillar, the first pillar, the pillar of influence. Before we begin, I want you to think about uh, who's been a positive influence in your life over the years. What qualities does that individual uh, possess that you admire about them? Now, think about uh, those who have been the most influential in your life and in that. So, according to Relevant Children's uh, Ministry, uh, they say that no one has more influence in a child's life than his or her parents. Growing up in a single-parent home, my mom took top spot in my life as the most influential person. Now, The number two person in my life, well, that's a bit more tricky. You see, I didn't have a dad at the time because I was growing up in a single-parent home. So I had many people that filled that spot. I had uncles and aunties and pastors and friends. Before my stepdad came onto the scene when I was age 10 and, and then filled that spot, there was this man who had the greatest influence over me. And that man was my grandfather, Reverend G. Lloyd Lovering. Now... I have a picture of him, uh, uh, from, of him and I at my Bible college graduation in the top left-hand drawer of my desk. He is my inspiration of becoming a pastor. He genuinely loved people, and people loved him. He had a positive influence on people around him, especially me, his grandson. Integral people of influence value people more than they value position. However, many equated power with coercion or might and dominance. This idea comes from 16th century political treaty, The Prince, written by Italian diplomat and political theist Nicola Machiavelli. And, his, and it was an instruction guide for new princes or royals. Now, he wrote, it is much safer to be feared than loved. He advocated that manipulation and occasional cruelty was the best means to power. However, Berkeley psychologist Dr. Uh, Dacker Keltner argues that true power requires modesty and empathy, not force and coercion. And that to have enduring power involves six characteristics, empathy, giving, Expressing gratitude, telling stories that unite, integrity, and humility. Unfortunately, the very traits that enable leaders to gain power disappear once they hold power. British historian Lord Acton said, Power tends to corrupt absolute. Power corrupts absolutely. Bill Pipke, in his book, Integrity, the Best Foundation, says, Be careful when position outranks character, or when privilege guides rather than commitment to a cause. Dr. Dacker Keltner introduces this term called the power paradox. Now, the power paradox requires that we be ever vigilant against the corruptive influences of power and its ability to distort the way we see ourselves and treat others. Instead of succumbing to Machiavellian, uh, uh, to a Machiavellian worldview, which unfortunately selects Machiavellian uh, leaders, we must promote a different model of power, one rooted in social intelligence, responsibility, and cooperation. Bill shares uh, a a story, uh, actually an African proverb in his book, and it's about this tree that is uh, being destroyed by a very small bug. One day, a huge tree fell to the ground. The bark on the trunk seemed like it was healthy, yet inside it had been totally eaten away. Someone asked, how did such a strong tree die? A wise man answered, a small bug killed the tree by attacking it internally. Well, the inquirer continued, but how could the insect enter such a magnificent tree? The wise man replied, the bug enters the tree while it is in full bloom. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. 
See, when in position of power, there's temptation. The temptation of corruption is very high. Whether at home, at work, or in a nation, the misuse of power and authority destroys the foundations of society. From a young age, children learn about authority in the home from their parents or guardians. What they learn during this imp- these impressionable years is often repu- replicated as they become adults. For instance, have you ever caught yourself uh, as a parent saying some of the same phrases your parent used on you when you were a child? Like, think about this, like, well, when I was your age, your age, I walked to school in knee-deep snow, uphill both ways. Uh, if you keep making that face, it's going to freeze that way. If you act like a child, then I will treat you like one. Because I said so, that's why. If all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you? <laughs> and my personal favorite, as long as you're under my roof, you will live by my rules. I want to share... I want to steer your attention today to an ancient Jewish family who lived in the land of Canaan, modern-day Palestine, Syria, and Israel around 1915 BC. This family was quite a prominent family in the Jewish history as the father, Jacob, had 12 sons that would later become the 12 tribes of Israel. This family was exceptionally dysfunctional. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. And each of his wives had a maidservant, uh, Bila and Zilpah. Now, Rachel was the wife that he loved most. And she, when she was finally able to conceive, he showed extreme favoritism to her firstborn. They named him Joseph. One day, Jacob gave Joseph a colorful coat, which conferred special privilege to him. This triggered animosity and resentment among the rest of his older brothers. Usually it's the youngest siblings that would be out tending the flocks while the firstborn was given kind of the management position of overseeing the family farm. The eldest would be groomed and mentored to one day take over the family business. This should have been Reuben's position as he was the eldest of all the children. But it was Joseph, Jacob's favorite, the second youngest who received that privilege. Now, Joseph uh, stepped into this position at about the age of 17. Now, we can only assume that possibly at that time, Reuben, the eldest, was given a demotion. Imagine a younger sibling having authority over you and telling you what you can do and what you can't do. And what about those times you refused to listen? And then they would go tattletailing off to daddy, right? While the brothers were out tending the flocks, Jacob sent Joseph to go check up on them. Now, the brothers, however, they went to a different location than where they were originally instructed to go. So you can only imagine when they see Joseph coming off far away, right? And they're thinking, oh, great. Now we're going to get it again. Little Joe is going to go running back to daddy and tell on us, and we're going to get it. Well, you know what? Enough's enough. I've had it with this little punk. So what they decided was we'll get, they devised a plan to actually get rid of him. I mean, how cruel is that? At first, they were going to kill him, but then they decided to throw him in a pit instead. As they were deciding on what their next move would be, some merchants happened to be coming down the road, and so they decided to make a few bucks off of him and sold him into slavery. When the merchants arrived in Egypt, he was then sold as a slave to the house of Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's royal guard. Now, God was with Joseph this entire time, and he granted him favor, and he was eventually put into management over the entire servants in Potiphar's home. Now, those management skills he must have learned from his dad, and and they came in handy at this point. However, it wasn't just Potiphar who took notice of Joseph's uh, particular skill set. In fact, Potiphar's wife took exception to his handsome features and physical physique. She would often make sexual advances, being inappropriate towards Joseph, but each time he denied her her, uh, attempts. So finally one day, she falsely accuses him of sexual assault, 
And, and, and why does she do this? Well, maybe she did it out of fear or self-preservation, fearing that maybe Joseph would then go and tell Potiphar, and Potiphar would be suspicious about her and about her advances. We don't know for sure. What we do know is that Potiphar was furious when his wife said, hey, Joseph tried to take advantage of me. So he was unwilling to hear Joseph's side, and he throws Joseph into prison. And it's not just any prison. This particular prison was where the enemies of Pharaoh were sent and forgotten. Now, at this point, no one would fault Joseph if he became embittered, angry, or overcome by despair. But he refused to be overcome with self-pity. Instead, he put his work ethic to work. Because God was with him and granted him favor, Joseph actually became head of all the prisoners. He became management in the prison and governed all the prisoners. Imagine that. While he was in prison, a couple of inmates had troubling dreams. And so Joseph, with God's, by way of God's Holy Spirit, was able to interpret those dreams. One of the uh, inmates was executed, and that was the fulfillment of the dream, while the other one was restored to their position as cupbearer, and that was what Joseph interpreted out of his dream. You see, years later, Pharaoh had a couple of dreams and was troubled by that. And the cupbearer is like, hey, wait a second. I remember when I was in prison, there was this guy, Joseph, and he was able to interpret my dreams. Maybe he could do the same to Pharaoh. So he goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, Pharaoh, listen. I, there's this guy in prison that y- you've got you to have come, and, and he'll interpret your dream. No pressure, Joseph. <laughs> so Joseph is brought before Pharaoh, and with God's help, he is able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Now, also with God's wisdom and his unique uh, set of management skills, Joseph offers Pharaoh counsel on how to prepare for these, what, these dreams are, what these dreams are all about. You see, Egypt would experience seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine. So Pharaoh promotes Joseph to be second in command of all Egypt. Now imagine that. Joseph held higher rank than his former master, Potiphar, who wrongly accused him and threw him into prison. Who's your daddy now, Potiphar? <laughs> But the story doesn't end there. After the famine struck Egypt, it also hit Joseph's homeland of Canaan. And who should show up seeking food and supplies in Egypt? His brothers. Their arrival provided Joseph with unprecedented opportunity for vengeance. He was in high, a high place of power and authority. And with the snap of his fingers, he could have exacted his revenge on them. But instead, he chose restraint by forgiving and showing kindness and grace to each of them. At Joseph's invitation, the entire family relocates to Egypt. You can read about Joseph's entire story in Genesis 37 to 47. Joseph's life began from a position of power that his dad had given him. But it led him to the pit. It led him to the house of Potiphar, then to prison, and ultimately to the palace. Dr. Dacker Keltner explains how we handle the power paradox guides our personal and work lives and determines ultimately how happy we are and, or we and the people uh, we care about will be. It determines our empathy, generosity, civility, innovation, intellectual rigor, and collaborative strength of our communities and social networks. Its ripple effects shape the patterns that, we make, up, that make up our families, neighborhoods, and workplaces, as well as a, the broader patterns of social organization that define societies and our cultural political struggles. Joseph's journey led him from valuing position to valuing people. Integral leadership positions us to a place of influence. Now, according to Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of the UK and the Commonwealth, he says this, power is a zero-sum game. The more we give away, the less we have. 
If you have influence and share it with nine people, you increase your influence ninefold as your influence spreads. As Christians, our positions of authority are, are meant to influence others. Our positions are meant to be more about others than they are about us. See, Jesus understood this when he stepped out of heaven and came down to earth. He, his equality with God, God was not something that he lorded over all humanity. In fact, the power paradox for him was to relinquish his position of authority so that he could influence humanity in being their servant. A servant who was willing to invest and give of his all, even to the point of death. When a couple of his disciples were jostling for position uh, of authority and, and wanted to sit at his right and left side, Jesus spoke to all the disciples saying this in Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 25. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The influencers in my life do not shy away from serving, especially when the duties they perform are well below their skill set. An influencer values people, not, not position. They care more about relationship than they do about prestige. Joseph, when he was second in command of all Egypt, cared more about reconciliation with his brothers than getting even or getting revenge. He was able to see clearly from God's vantage point that there was a bigger plan at play. What his brothers meant for evil, God was able to turn that around for good. His journey from position of power to the pit, to the house of Potiphar, to prison, and then to the palace was all part of God's design for Joseph's life. See, sometimes we can become so focused on our pain and our suffering that we lose sight of what God wants to do in our lives in those moments. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Rome. Listen to what he wrote. He said, And we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You see, God works in all things, in all situations, and in all circumstances for our good so that we can fulfill the purpose that he has for our lives. And our timeline here on earth is in full view of God. You see, he sees our past, and he sees our present, and he sees our future all at once. He knows how our story ends. What he wants from us, though, is obedience to his plan, which is a good and perfect plan that will end up benefiting us fully in the end. Jesus describes what kind of influence we should have in society. Listen to what he, what he said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it lights. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In society today, it's easy to really miss the real value of salt. 
for many of us, it's just something we add a pinch of to baking or cooking or maybe just simply seasoning our meal that's on our plate before us. But in ancient cultures, salt was of high value. You see, without salt, food storage would have been virtually impossible for the simple reason that meat decays. Now, rubbed into meat, salt would allow the meat to be stored for long periods of time without decay. Several of Jesus' disciples were fishermen and could have practiced this method of salting uh, down their catches. Now, Romans believed that there was nothing as valuable as salt except for the sun. Roman soldiers of Jesus' day were at times paid with salt. In fact, our word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which mean, or which is referred to the payment of, uh, to soldiers with salt. It would be said of someone who had a poor work ethic or was not very productive, ah, they're not worthy of their salt. As Christians, we are to be integral people of influence. We are to be salt and light to, to the world. Corruption is like decay in society. Without the influence of salt, moral decay will win the day. And, and what's interesting about salt is that it doesn't need to be in large supply to make a huge difference. Remember, just a pinch of salt in a recipe can make all the difference. So don't think of corruption as this huge giant that there's no possible way to infiltrate. Just a pinch of integrity can change the equation. How much light do you need to expel darkness? Well, even a little spark can make the difference. We are to be light in this dark world. Imagine a world without light. As Christians, we are to be the light wherever we go. In order for us to be people of integrity and of influence, we must have core values and stick to them. Now, Joseph had some core values that were non-negotiable. Because he held on tightly to those values, it created opportunities for him. But it also helped him to resist temptation. See, he didn't need money, sex, or power to satisfy his inner emptiness. You see, Bill Pipke states in his book that when integrity serves as the uh, foundation of power, the pillar of influence is at work. As parents, we are the main people of influence in our the lives of our children. They are daily taking in what you say and what you do and how you rea ra react to things or respond to things. We have such an awesome responsibility of parents. Stay-at-home moms, don't easily dismiss your importance. Yes, some days it'll feel like you're shoveling snow in the midst of a blizzard, feeling like you're getting zero done, but you are making a difference. What you do does matter. Your presence in your child's life, in your child's life matters. Dads, don't miss out on the opportunities with your children. Take time out of your busy schedules and be the superhero your child th thinks you are. Don't allow work to be your mistress. Before you know it, your child will be all grown up and moved out. Mom, teach, children's, teach children about matters of the heart. Dads, you teach your children how to make decisions. Jesus gave all of his followers these instructions before he left planet Earth. Listen to what he said in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Church, we are called to be people of integrity and influencers in society. That is how we spread the good news about Jesus. Not all of us will hold high positions of authority like Joseph, but we can influence those that are around us at our workplace, at school, in our neighborhood, in our community, at the grocery store, at the gas station, at the arena, at the gym, at the country club, in the parking lot. I, <laughs> I think you're catching my drift here. Be salt and light wherever you go. 
And may your integrity influence those around you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message today. I pray that it would encourage our hearts and strengthen some folks. Lord, I pray for those that are really battling with these matters of integrity. Maybe they've been let down by, by leaders around them. Father, I pray that, Father, they would maintain integrity. That they would not fall into the trap of coercion and, and extortion and all these other things just to gain power. But, Lord, I pray that as they influence others, and those that, that they've influenced go and influence others still, that their influence would grow. So, Father, I pray that we would be men and women that would be uh, salt of the earth, that we'd be a light to the world, reflecting all people to you, showing you uh, and in introducing them to you, Father. We thank you for this awesome privilege that you've called us. Thank you for influencing us so that we can influence others. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. You can join us next week at 1045 right here online. Or you can join us uh, live and in person at our two services on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. or our 1045. Take care, everyone. God bless.